I had finally found it, my new apartment, in a quaint complex. It promised a serene workspace away from the relentless chaos of my freelance graphic design career. I remember feeling a wave of relief wash over me as I unpacked my last box, thinking I could finally settle into a routine of creativity and calm. However, just a few days into my new life, I noticed something odd. It started as a small, almost imperceptible stain on the living room ceiling, a slight discoloration that I thought little of initially. Perhaps it was just old paint or a trick of the light I mused, not wanting to face the possibility of complications in my newly acquired apartment. But as days turned into a week, the minor stain began to morph into a more ominous sign. The discoloration darkened, spreading across the ceiling like a slow, encroaching shadow. Then came the drips. At first, just occasional drops that I caught in a small bucket. But soon, a steady, unsettling drip-drip that echoed through the quiet apartment. The water damage was worsening rapidly, each drip a stark reminder that not all was as peaceful as it appeared. My heart sank with the realization that this issue was far more serious than I had hoped. With increasing urgency, I reached out to the building management to report the worsening water damage. The response was frustratingly nonchalant. They assured me it was a minor issue, something they'd schedule for repair when feasible. Each dismissive reply left me feeling more helpless, my calls for help lost in an endless loop of bureaucratic indifference. Despite the growing stain overhead, I tried to redirect my focus back to my design projects, the colorful swirls on my screen a stark contrast to the gray expanse slowly creeping across my ceiling. But the constant plop of water into the makeshift bucket in my living room was a relentless distraction, a drip-drip symphony that grew more insistent with each passing day. Then, one stormy night, the inevitable happened. I was jolted awake by a thunderous crash, followed by the sound of cascading water. Heart pounding, I leapt out of bed and rushed into the living room, only to find a gaping hole in the ceiling. Through it, remnants of the apartment above hung ominously. Dark stains and tattered bits of what looked disturbingly like crime scene tape flapping in the draft. The sight was horrifying. Blood-stained plaster and broken beams spoke silently of a violent struggle that had been hidden right above me. I called the police immediately, my hands trembling as I dialed. Within minutes, the apartment was swarming with officers, the blue lights of their cruisers casting eerie shadows through my waterlogged living room. As the police began their investigation, sealing off my apartment as part of the crime scene, I watched the remnants of my peace of mind being carted away with the debris. That's when I found them. Strange artifacts buried amidst the wreckage. There were old, yellowed photographs depicting people I didn't recognize, their faces etched with expressions of joy and sorrow. Among the photographs, there lay a mysterious key, ornate and heavy, hinting at secrets far older and more profound than the mundane contents of a typical apartment. I wondered about the stories these objects could tell. Who were the people in the photographs? What doors did this key open? As I turned the key over in my hands, I felt the weight of a story yet to unfold, its chapters written in the hidden corners of my new home. In the days following my unsettling discovery, the atmosphere around me thickened with paranoia. Every creak and whisper of the old building seemed amplified, each sound a potential harbinger of unseen threats. At night, I lay awake, straining against the silence certain I could hear footsteps padding softly outside my door. My belongings seemed to shift subtly from where I remembered placing them. Books no longer aligned on their shelf, a chair slightly askew. The air was thick with the presence of someone, or something, watching. That's when I decided to take matters into my own hands. I installed small cameras around my apartment, discreet eyes meant to catch whatever, or whoever, was haunting the fringes of my disrupted life. What I discovered on playback a few days later sent a chill down my spine. The footage clearly showed the building's maintenance man using his own set of keys to enter my apartment. His visits weren't random. He moved with purpose, checking dark corners and even behind furniture, as though he were searching for something hidden. Confrontation was inevitable. The next time the camera alerted me to his presence, I waited quietly. As he entered, I stepped into the living room, my heart racing. Looking for something? I asked, 
the weight of my unspoken accusations hanging between us. He stopped, the surprise registering briefly before his expression hardened. You shouldn't have gotten involved, he said, his tone more of a warning than an admonition. His eyes darted around the room, then back to me. There's more at play here than you know. This isn't just about a simple crime. It's bigger than you. I held my ground, despite the instinct to back away. What are you looking for? I pressed, needing to understand. He sighed, a sound of resignation. Something left behind by the previous tenant, the one involved in the crime. It's valuable to certain people. He glanced towards the door, his posture tense. And you're part of this? I asked, disbelief mingling with a growing sense of dread. I'm just a small piece in a bigger puzzle, he admitted. Listen, just stay out of it. Forget what you've seen, stop digging. It's not safe for you. There are people involved who wouldn't hesitate to correct mistakes. His implication was clear and the threat sent a wave of fear through me. Yet, as he turned to leave, part of me rebelled against the idea of being bullied into silence. I can't do that, I said quietly, more to myself than to him. I need to know the truth. He paused at the door, looking back at me. Then you'd better be careful, he said, before slipping out into the night. Left alone, I felt the weight of his words settle around me. The danger was real, but so was my need to uncover what was hidden in the shadows of my own home. My resolve hardened. I would find the truth, no matter the cost. Despite the palpable threat that now shadowed my every move, I knew I couldn't let fear dictate my actions. The footage, glaring evidence of intrusion and possible deeper criminal involvement, couldn't just be ignored. With a resolute breath, I transferred the files onto a USB drive. I then mailed it anonymously to the local police station, careful to leave no trace that could lead back to me. Days turned into anxious waiting. I kept to myself, hyper aware of every glance thrown my way, every car that lingered too long on the street outside. Finally, a break came. The police announced they were investigating a potential criminal network linked to several unsolved cases in the city all potentially connected to my apartment complex. My footage had sparked a deeper look into activities that went beyond mere property management. I watched from my window as police cars and unmarked vehicles became a common sight in the complex. Officers moving in and out of the building with purpose. It was a small comfort, a silent acknowledgement that my actions had consequences, hopefully leading to some semblance of justice. But as the investigation unfolded, I couldn't shake that the threat remained. A whisper in the dark, suggesting my search for the truth, was far from over. The maintenance man had vanished, leaving behind more questions than answers. At night, the familiar sound of inexplicable footsteps echoed faintly, and my belongings sometimes shifted slightly, as if touched by unseen hands. As I double-checked the locks on my doors one evening, the mysterious key I had found caught the light. It lay heavy in my hand, a silent invitation to deeper secrets, perhaps best left undisturbed. I pondered my next move, wondering if some doors, once opened, might unveil truths I wasn't ready to face. We were ecstatic to finally move into our new apartment, a quiet place that seemed perfect for starting our new chapter together. It was a sunny Saturday when we first met Sarah and Tom, our neighbors directly across the hall. They greeted us with warm smiles and a homemade apple pie, making us feel welcomed immediately. Everything was going wonderfully until I noticed something odd in their stories. Tom once mentioned living here for three years, but later, during dinner, Sarah casually mentioned they had moved in just last year. It was probably nothing. A simple slip of the tongue, I thought. But as the days passed, more inconsistencies surfaced. They were small discrepancies, conflicting stories about previous jobs, past vacations, even the breed of a dog they claimed to have owned. Each inconsistency was trivial on its own, but together they formed a pattern that was hard to ignore. Mark noticed it too, and we couldn't help but wonder, who were Sarah and Tom, really? The discrepancies in Sarah and Tom's stories gnawed at us. One evening, over cups of coffee, 
Sarah enthusiastically described their former beachfront condo in Florida, a story starkly different from Tom's previous account of leaving a bustling New York lifestyle just months ago. These inconsistencies, once overlooked, now seemed glaring. Driven by a mixture of curiosity and concern, Mark and I began a quiet investigation. We started with casual conversations with other residents during evening walks or in the laundry room. Surprisingly, a few neighbors hinted at their own reservations about Sarah and Tom. They're nice enough, but something doesn't quite add up, Mr. Jennings from the second floor whispered during one chat, his eyes darting around as if he feared being overheard. Our suspicion deepened. Late one night, I decided to search online for any clues that could explain our neighbor's elusive past. A search for the address of our apartment complex led me to a Facebook profile of Michael and Susan, the couple who were listed in an old online newsletter as the winners of the complex's holiday decoration contest, residing in what was now Sarah and Tom's apartment. The profile for Michael and Susan showed vibrant, active lives filled with friends and family gatherings. But the activity stopped abruptly about a year ago, the exact time Sarah and Tom claimed they had moved in. The last post was a photo of Susan, captioned, Excited about our trip next week. After that, nothing. No more photos, no status updates, no event responses. It was as if they had vanished into thin air. This chilling discovery made the situation feel all the more sinister. I showed Mark the profiles and explained the timeline. We lay awake most of that night, our minds racing with possible explanations. Were Sarah and Tom using fake identities? And if so, what had happened to Michael and Susan? We knew we had to keep digging to uncover the truth behind our too perfect to be true neighbors, no matter how disturbing it might turn out to be. We managed to find a cousin of Susan's through the comments on one of her last Facebook posts. Hesitantly, I reached out, explaining our peculiar situation and our growing concerns about the couple currently living in Susan and Michael's apartment. The cousin, Ellen, responded quickly and with obvious worry. I haven't heard from them in weeks, she confessed, her voice trembling over the phone. It's not like Susan to just go silent. They were supposed to come visit us after their trip, but they never showed up, and now no one can reach them. Her fear confirmed our worst suspicions. We reported everything to the local police, but the process was frustratingly slow. They took our statements but advised that without direct evidence of foul play, their hands were tied. Mark and I decided we couldn't just wait and hope for the best. We vowed to uncover the truth ourselves, no matter what it might reveal. One chilly evening, Mark and I knocked on Sarah and Tom's door. When they opened, their usual friendly demeanor faltered under our serious expressions. In their living room, we presented them with everything we had found, printouts of Michael and Susan's Facebook profiles, their sudden disappearance from social media, and Ellen's testimony about their unexplained absence. Sarah's face turned pale, while Tom's hands shook visibly as he tried to laugh it off. You've got it all wrong, Tom stammered, his eyes darting around nervously. There's a simple explanation for all of this. But as they fumbled through their explanations, their stories were rife with contradictions and implausible details. Our confrontation seemed to unsettle them further, and they excused themselves to the kitchen under the pretense of making tea. Seizing the moment, Mark and I decided to take a risk and quickly search their apartment for any additional clues. Behind a false panel in their hallway, we discovered a small concealed door. Heart pounding, we pushed it open to reveal a hidden room. Inside, the air was musty, heavy with the scent of old paper and dust. It was like stepping into someone else's life. The room was filled with boxes containing personal items, mail, and even passports belonging to Michael and Susan. There were also several large suitcases, half-packed as if the owners had planned to leave in a hurry but never got the chance. This horrifying discovery confirmed our worst fears. Sarah and Tom were not who they pretended to be, and something sinister had happened to the real tenants of the apartment. As we stood amidst the remnants of Michael and Susan's lives, the gravity of our discovery settled in. We were involved in something far more dangerous than we had ever imagined. With the damning evidence in hand, we immediately called the police who arrived within minutes. The discovery of the hidden room and its contents were enough to escalate the matter urgently. Officers detained Sarah and Tom, 
who were now visibly rattled and unable to maintain their facade. As the police began their formal investigation, they uncovered a troubling pattern. Sarah and Tom had a long history of fraud and identity theft, moving from state to state, assuming new identities each time. Their true backgrounds began to emerge, revealing a calculated deceit that spanned years and victimized countless unsuspecting individuals. Despite the police's swift response, Sarah managed to slip away in the chaos, leaving only Tom in custody. Mark and I were left with a lingering unease, the shadow of Sarah's escape a constant presence. We wondered if she would return for revenge or if there were other hidden threats within our seemingly peaceful apartment complex yet to be uncovered. A few days later, my phone buzzed with a new email. An anonymous sender had sent a photo of Sarah in a bustling city far from ours, clearly continuing her manipulative schemes. That evening, as we discussed our next steps, Mark froze, peering out the window. Someone's watching us, he whispered, nodding towards a nondescript car across the street. The realization hit us. Our involvement with Sarah and Tom had drawn us into a deeper web of danger, signaling that our ordeal was far from over. Moving to the heart of a bustling city was supposed to be the start of something big for me. I was ready, full of ambition and eager to dive into my new job, my new life. Apartment 4B in a sleek modern complex seemed like the perfect base for my fresh start. The building had the charm of urban life with its crisp lines and a view that captured the city's restless energy. At first, everything in the apartment felt just right. The space was more generous than I expected. The natural light pouring in through large windows made the rooms warm and inviting, and my few possessions found their places as if they were meant to be there. However, it didn't take long for the initial thrill to be nudged by puzzling disturbances. I started noticing small oddities, a carton of milk less full than I remembered, a book shifted from its place on the shelf, or my sneakers not tucked away where I left them. At first I brushed it off, blaming my own forgetfulness in the whirlwind of adjusting to a new city and a demanding job. But as these occurrences became more frequent, I couldn't shake off the creeping unease. Something was off, and I began to wonder if my cozy apartment wasn't quite my own. As the days passed, the oddities in my apartment evolved from mere nuisances to clear invasions of my private space. Food items began disappearing at an alarming rate. Not just a sip of milk here or a bite of bread there, but whole meals gone. My personal belongings shuffled around more noticeably. An unsettling feeling settled over me each evening as I returned from work, half expecting to find something amiss. Enough was enough. I decided it was time to take action. One afternoon, after a particularly disheartening discovery of my favorite pasta sauce smeared on the counter and my cutlery misplaced, I went out and bought a night vision camera. I installed it discreetly in the kitchen, with another angle covering the living area, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever was happening while I was away. The setup was simple enough, and by the next day, I was ready to review the footage. I sat down with a cup of coffee early in the morning, the city just beginning to stir outside my windows, and played the first recording. The screen flickered to life, showing the dim outlines of my apartment bathed in the ghostly glow of night vision. For hours, the footage showed nothing more unusual than me switching off the lights and heading to bed. Then, around 2 a.m., the lock clicked. My breath caught as the door slowly opened, and a figure slipped inside. It wasn't a shadow or a trick of the light. It was a person, using a key with practiced ease. The intruder was neither hurried nor hesitant. They moved with a familiarity that chilled me. They went straight to the fridge, took out food, and then sat down on my couch, turning on the TV to low volume, seemingly at home in my apartment. My heart pounded as I watched this stranger make themselves comfortable in my space. This was no ghost or fleeting shadow. This was a real, tangible person who had access to my home. They were there for over an hour, eating, watching, and then meticulously cleaning up after themselves before they left, locking the door behind them. The revelation hit me hard. Someone else had a key to my apartment. Someone who seemed to think they had every right to be there. The implications of this were terrifying, and I knew I had to find out who this person was, and how they had come to possess a key to my place. I hesitated to involve the police just yet, 
Instead, I decided to handle the matter personally, driven by a mix of curiosity and fear. My plan was to catch the intruder in the act, to directly confront them and demand answers. I hoped understanding their motives might give me peace of mind, or at least inform my next steps. To set the trap, I spread the word among a few neighbors and mentioned on social media that I'd be visiting friends out of town for the weekend. I made a show of packing my car with a suitcase and drove off, only to circle back and park a block away. I re-entered my building discreetly, using the service entrance, and settled into the small guest room, which had a separate lock I had installed earlier for extra security. The room also provided a clear view of the apartment's entrance and the living area through a slightly ajar door. From my hidden vantage point, I waited. The hours ticked by slowly, filled with tense anticipation. Finally, just after midnight, I heard the now familiar click of the key in the lock. The door swung open, and in stepped Ms. Harper, the previous tenant. I recognized her from a photo I'd seen in the building manager's office. My heart raced as I stepped out to confront her. Ms. Harper, I called out, causing her to startle and drop the grocery bag she was carrying. Why are you here? I demanded. Ms. Harper looked at me, a mix of embarrassment and defiance in her eyes. I used to live here. I, I still have the key. I didn't know where else to go, she confessed, her voice breaking. The confrontation was nothing like I expected. Instead of an anonymous thief or a faceless menace, here was a woman, crushed by circumstances, clinging to the last remnants of her former life. Her presence was an intrusion, certainly, but now it was also a deeply human story, unfolding right in what I had come to call my home. Ms. Harper, clutching the remnants of her dignity along with her grocery bag, spilled her story through choked sobs. I was evicted over a misunderstanding. I lost my job soon after, and without any family or close friends, I've had nowhere else to go. She looked around the apartment with a mournful gaze. I've been trying to stay invisible, coming here only at night to avoid confrontation. I thought, I thought if I could just keep up appearances, I could figure things out. As I listened, my initial anger softened to empathy, but the severity of the situation lingered. Ms. Harper, I understand you're in a tough spot, but you can't stay here like this. It's not right for either of us, and legally it's precarious for you too, I reasoned, my voice firm yet gentle. The tension between my sympathy for her plight and the need to protect my own space created a thick air of conflict. We stood in a tense standoff. It was clear that Ms. Harper realized the gravity of her actions. Her shoulders slumped, defeated. I... I don't know what to do anymore, she admitted, tears streaming down her face. Seeing her break down, my resolve to find a compassionate resolution strengthened. Let's find you some help, I offered. There are shelters, food services, and job assistance programs that can give you a chance to get back on your feet. Ms. Harper nodded, a flicker of hope crossing her tired features. Would you really help me with that? She asked, almost incredulous. Yes, I replied, already pulling out my phone to search for local services that could offer immediate assistance. No one should have to go through this alone. As we sat down to discuss her options, a mutual understanding began to bridge the gap between us. This moment marked the beginning of Ms. Harper's journey towards reclaiming her life, guided by a newfound ally in the very person whose home she had invaded. With renewed purpose, I dialed the number for the local social services and explained Ms. Harper's situation. They quickly arranged for temporary housing and promised to connect her with employment resources. As Ms. Harper gathered her few belongings, a small smile hinted at her gratitude. Later that day, a locksmith came to change the locks on the apartment door. I watched as each old lock was replaced, symbolizing a new beginning for both of us. I also installed a new security system to ensure this kind of vulnerability wouldn't happen again. Relief and resolve settled over me as I took these necessary steps toward securing my home.